Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. And it's my pleasure to welcome Simon Baker here to give a talk about his work on face research and other research that he's doing at CMU. Uh, Simon was an intern here in 1997 along with Ross, so we have a lot of illustrious alumni. Um, and uh, since then he finished his PhD at Columbia and he was a postdoc and now he's a research scientist at Carnegie Mellon University. Thank you, Rick. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll start by just, uh, you know, saying that this isn't all entirely my work. I mean, it's mainly a collaboration between myself and Ian Matthews. Ian was a postdoc at CMU who, who worked with me and is now actually a systems faculty at CMU. And then recently this project has grown and we've sort of branched out and sort of started applying the technology to expression and to a variety of other projects. And so more people have got involved. Okay, so I'm going to talk about face models. So what is a face model? And the simplest way to think about this, a face model is just something that takes a bunch of parameter values and returns a face image. And typically those parameters can be divided into shape parameters and appearance parameters. Um, so the two most well-known face models are active appearance models and 3D morphable models. And many of you are probably aware of these. Um, so we published two pretty seminal papers in the late 80s, sorry, late 90s. Uh, describing these papers, and uh, we've primarily been working with active appearance models, but the, the difference between these two types of models is actually pretty small. These two papers are more similar than they are different. Um, this is a, a, an active appearance model, and what I'm showing here is a rendering varying the first four parameters. So as I vary these parameters, the shape changes, and so you get these pose variation, the, uh, the appearance changes, and so I see different identities, and potentially different lighting, and when you combine them, I get sort of a combined face that moves with pose, expression, uh, identity, and lighting changes. Okay, that's fine. So this is, at this point, it's a graphics model. Um, the key to use this for computer vision, we need to essentially invert that model with the fitting problem, which is given an image, tell me the parameters, the shape parameters, the appearance parameters, the best match that image in some sense. And this is, it's going to be a nonlinear optimization. And so the main technical uh, techniques underneath this are all going to be nonlinear optimization algorithms. And the primary emphasis is going to be fitting speed rather than robustness or any other measure. So what does fitting look like? Just to know what you're talking about, um, these are a few examples of, I think, of five frames in here. We initialize the model. These are actually essentially initialized by hand, but the whole system w does initialize from a face detector, and I'll show you an example later. But you can put the face mesh on the, the image relatively far away from the correct answer, and you set the nonlinear optimization going, and it fits. Fitting means solving for the 3D shape parameters. So you'll see as the optimization goes, the 3D shape changes, not dramatically, but the mouth changes, the eyes open, and so on. And the pose changes, which is essentially a camera matrix, is we solve for the right pose of the face. Okay, this is fitting. Fitting generally means one frame. If I say fitting, I'm fit to one frame. Okay, if I have a video sequence, okay, I can fit to each frame in that video sequence in term, and that is tracking. So tracking is really just model fitting to each frame in term in a video sequence. Okay. So now, over time, I extract the 3D shape of this face, and it deforms non-rigidly to account for the expression of the face. So essentially, we track the face in 3D non-rigidly at 60 frames per second. OK. So, sure. That video you were just playing shows it's pretty good even if you move around. Are there? many cases in which it loses track and, and the model goes bananas for a while and, uh, and if it happens, do you recover quickly? Right, so um, you can lose track. Um, definitely, it's a nonlinear optimization. It's subject to nonlinear, right, so that's inevitable. So you, the final system does have to have a reinitialization step. 
Uh, I'll show you a movie later where we reinitialize no problem. Um, it, it does initialize from a face detector. There's no, no hand initialization. Well, some of these movies have hand initialization, but the, the system does. Uh, are you just doing this per frame, or, or what kind of information are you using between frames? Uh, we're using the output of each frame to initialize the, set, the next uh -huh. frame, but there's no like camera filtering or anything. No motion or right. anything like that. You, you could impose those sort of constraints pretty easily. But you don't need to with your frames. Right. Um, okay, so i just now going to describe a few applications, um, just so that you know what we're really working towards and why real time is important. So, one of the things that, yeah, I think these things are great for head pose estimation is really accurate. This is an example in the lab. Sorry, this is a little bit washed out, but this is basically tracking my face and then computing the head pose and then mapping that head pose onto the, the screen. Just taking the yaw angle and the pitch angle. We know the distance to the screen. We can mark roughly where I'm looking. The, the head pose estimation is about one plus or minus one degree accuracy. So when you say where I'm looking, oh, sorry. Center. Sorry, where the head is facing. Okay, that's a good point. Okay, that's so. Uh, when I say head pose, I mean where the head is facing. If I say gaze, I mean where the eyes are looking. Okay, because I'm finding it hard to make my gay sort of track with my head, right? I think we have a right. tendency to saccade or something. Right. So this is this is the head pose. Okay. Yep. Um, so. Okay, this is almost the same movie, but it's running in the company that funded this research, Denso, in, in their lab in Japan. And this is the movie with the Japanese uh, English on it. Um, so Denso are interested in this for a number of reasons. One um, they're developing a windshield display, so a projector under the windshield that displays onto the windshield. A variety of companies are developing this. The reason you need to track the head for this is to compensate for the parallax. So the, num the first thing they want to display on this is navigation control signals. If you've ever used a navigation system and it's here, I nearly always kill myself whenever I use one. It's, so they want to overlay on the, the lanes, you know, turn right here. And for that, to compensate for the parallax of the head, you need to know where the head is. Also, um, there's, a, there's a regulation that airbag systems have to, in the future, based on where the head is positioned. So if you know where the head is, you can actually time the airbag, depending on how far it is from the system. You can also direct the airbag. And so if you know where the head is, you can save and reduce the number of injuries. But that's, that's before the collision, right? Because once the collision happens, presumably you need to be tracking it. 300 hertz um, or something. Basically, no, if you know the speed of the car and, you know, maybe have inertial sensors that measure the deceleration, but you know you can model, if the head's here, then you can model how it's going to behave. Oh, okay. So, um, and more futuristically, they're looking to, for systems that I'm going to monitor the drivers where they're looking, um, where their head is pointing, and maybe potentially, if you're going to display warnings to the driver, you have to be really careful. That's a difficult user interface question of how to do that. And based on, so they want to look into a sort of advanced uh, intelligent warning systems that only display warnings depending on whether the driver has seen that danger or not. So as I said, we were recently in Japan. They demoed this at uh, the Intelligent Transportation Systems World Congress. And fortunately, we had to leave because of the typhoon. But uh, so we didn't get too many photos. So this, we only got this one photo of the demo. I was hoping to get everybody to look at the camera, but they wouldn't. They were all uh, looking at the emperor's son who was walking down here. And so these, we came back, and these were the only two photos on the camera, which is a bit unfortunate. OK, back, back to your point, Rick, the, the eye direction. OK, so uh, there are a variety of ways to estimate the gaze. Um, there are a lot of active systems, but if you have a purely passive system, you need basically three pieces of information. You need the location of the pupil, you need the location of the inner and outer corners, and you need the head pose. And the accuracy of the whole system is just as dependent on the inner and outer corners as on the pupil. And so this is actually a really good way to estimate the, the inner and outer corners and the head pose. And I mean, the way we estimate the iris is, the, the center of the iris is pretty standard. That's relatively simple. So this was, again, it's a car demo. So we have two cameras, one looking at the driver and one looking out of the front of the car. And this is actually the, the hood of the car here. And we sort of calibrated the rotation between the cameras. 
So you can take the gaze estimate, um, German on the left, and as he, as he follows uh, Taka here on the right, we can sort of project where he's looking. And we told him, you know, follow Taka. This is, this is Taka. And follows him pretty well. Roughly speaking, this is about five degrees. Ballpark. And, and this is a case where obviously common filtering or something would help. Right. So a common question get asked is this. Is the, is, is the jitter the noise, or is it saccade? And I, I don't actually know the answer to that. So we just haven't looked. But in any case, you could potentially feel Right. Um, actually, the, of those two movies, the pose estimation movie, there is no filtering of the output. What it's actually showing is the raw uh, output. That one, although it's still jittery, that even has some smoothing. Um, okay, so face models also may be good for face recognition. There's a variety of ways you could use these face models. Um, the simplest way to think about it is for pose normalization. So there are a bunch of uh, evaluations of face recognition systems. Jonathan Phillips runs one every two years, the facial recognition vendor test, and they always come back every year and they always say the same thing. The biggest problem is the head pose. And if the, if the person's not looking at the camera, you just get garbage, basically, with commercial systems. So this is, you know, this is just sort of an illustration. If I can track German's head, then I can generate a frontal view, and I apply my face detector here rather than here, and I do, you know, empirical studies that show that that does help. Okay. Um, so another thing that's good with these sort of models is moving things. Faces move, right? So expression, uh, expression recognition. This is a collaboration with a psychologist at the University of Pittsburgh, Jeff Cohn. Uh, he's studying, amongst other things, the interaction between a mother and a baby. So the mother smiles, then how long does it take for the baby to smile? And that tells you something about the developmental process of the baby. And also the vice versa, the baby smiles, how long does the mother smile? Also a variety of um, mental diseases can be diagnosed based on expression and uh, physical disabilities too. There's actually a variety of other interesting things with uh, expression. Perhaps the most controversial is we probably have funding to look into using facial expression to tell you whether you're lying to an INS agent or not. So this, I mean, clearly it's not going to be enough on its own, but it's sort of as an extension of uh, polygraphs and uh, potentially use that in combination with audio signals. It's also growing work on remote physiological sensors. So I put a camera here, or maybe a thermal camera, and I can measure your, your respiration rate, your heart rate, um, and other sort of physiological measurements. Is there any psychological evidence yeah. that... There's some. Yeah, that expression... Right, so th there, are, there are some papers. There's um, Paul Ekman, if you have... Right, so he, yeah. he's written... Paul's got an axe to grind, right? He's got a very specific <laughs> system. I mean, right. some of you guys know facts, or right. you've heard about it. But I think, you know, independent of facts, they have, uh, assist, you know, the, just analyzing videos. And, and there are also these things called wizards, I think, that these people that can tell whether you're lying by looking, looking at you. There's a certain percentage of people that are really, you know, the statistical experiments are pretty good at telling. Okay. We could digress a lot on this quite a lot. It becomes pretty interesting. There's also a question of, suppose you want to do this, how do you build a database that's ground truth? Yeah. That, you know, you, you tell someone, come into the lab, and lie to me. Yeah. Right. Well, that's no use, right? So you have to convince them that if they, if they don't lie to you, if they don't do what they're supposed to do, they're somehow going to get penalized. I think the standard thing they do is like, OK, come in, try to convince me you're lying. And if you fail, we're going to give you an electric shock. What about poker players? Uh, well, we should uh, probably go yeah. on. OK. <laughs> so, um, so there are also a lot of graphics applications of these models. I mean, this is, this is very simple. We just, um, just to show that we can take the expression and we can apply it to, like in this case, it's a Japanese no mask, that it does, we can generate simple animations. There's, um, this is an area that we haven't worked on too much, but you can also use these models for audio-visual speech synthesis. So you know speech synthesis, you type in, hello, my name is Simon, and the system says that. You could also type in, my name is Simon, and it produces a video. So Ezat and Posio have used develop perhaps the best system for this. Finally, um, this could potentially be used. We, again, we haven't actively re researched this as more. You can use these models for low bandwidth video conferencing. 
one way to look at these models is a, is a compact way of coding a face. And it's sort of very similar to the, the MPEG models of faces. OK, so that just a brief overview. Of, ask, sure. But on that video, it looks like the cheekbone is not very well captured by, by the model. Right. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, is that because you really didn't care much about that? You, it could be refined. Right. So um, I think if you're touching on a good point. Um, in that one of the limitations of, of, I mean, the benefit of our technique, say, compared to a lot of related work, is that it runs real time. One of the disadvantages, for a variety of technical reasons, we do have very little information in the cheeks. And if you think of these models, really those triangles are flat triangles. So that this model of the face is definitely a little flat. I can show you other movies Maybe later. The sampling is not enough. Right. The, 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 the so part of that becomes from the fact we're creating these from images rather than range data. Um, but there were, we have ideas on how to flush these out. Yeah, it'd be fascinating because we, we know we know the creases right or forth from into reflection and so on. Right. So there's a very strong image cue there. Right. It might break your real time for now, but it, right. it's, it's definitely there. So I think the fitting algorithm is largely independent of the number of triangles. The main reason we don't have triangles there is the, um, the difficulty. We build these from images, and so how do you sort of get the training data? To, f to flesh out the cheeks. Right. But, Unless you like apply the shape from shading, which is right. kind of iffy, but yeah. yeah. So but there's, there's some hope there are things you can do there. But that, that's definitely a very good point. Um, what kind of uh, resolution do you require? And I think all of your sequences have very controlled backgrounds. Right. Uh, so um, does this work uh, in, in real right. scenarios? Um, the, the background can be reasonably cluttered. I mean, obviously, quality of the video. Um, but people are moving around in the background. Th that's works. okay. That's okay. Yeah, what, what breaks it? Um, what breaks it? So the number one thing that breaks it is um, if the camera totally changes. The I mean, these are well. These models don't generalize too well. For, if I build a model for like 20 people and I bring in another person, that is the big technical challenge. That. It typically works only on the people that you've trained it for. So you can think of it as sort of like speaker-dependent speech right. recognition. Right. Okay. So that's the state of that's what I would describe as the state of the art today. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that is also the big challenge. That people work on. But there's but the training can happen if you have if you're working with one user in the office, right, right. or something like that. Right. The system can presumably get better over right. time. Right. And definitely, the sort of up modeling model update is a thing that we've worked on, and I, I don't know whether I'll get time to get to that, but. Um, so that's that's the main limitation. The quality. I mean, the underlying model is quite small. It's maybe just 100 pixels by 100 pixels. So the resolution is, you know, I'm not saying that you know worse quality video is is not going to make it worse. But you know, sh sure. I mean, it's a valid point. We c capture as good quality video so the videos look as good as possible. All right. Okay. Um, so. This is actually like a pretty big, wide open area. There's lots of different things you could work on. You can work on the applications. I could take this model and I could build a video conference system. I could also work on the construction problem. A lot of people are working on this. It's like, how do I build these models from, three, from images? How do I update the model? As, as you suggested, Rick, as over time, learn a better model for somebody. And then there's the fitting question. How do I fit these models in real time? And that is the, the main focus of this talk. And um, I will also try to touch on the, the model construction problem. We'll see how that goes. Um, so real-time fitting. OK. So some related work. So the, the original Kutz and Taylor paper, they, they, there was a fitting algorithm in there. And to be honest with you, it's sort of ad hoc. It's kind of, let's just assume that this is update of this form, this particular functional form, learn the parameters using linear regression. And it's a sort of provably wrong in some sense. But it runs reasonably fast. It's like 4.1 4 seconds per frame. That's not too bad. I mean, that's on a relatively slow machine these days. I guess that would be less than a second per frame. Then there's the, the Blance and Vetter paper. This I actually pulled these numbers out of the PAMI paper, which is an application to face recognition, a little bit later than the SIGGRAPH paper. The way that they fit is you initially hand mark six to eight points, semi-automatic. Six to eight points is giving the system 12 to 
16 numbers, almost telling it the answer, and then it still takes 4.5 minutes per frame. Okay, but, but that's, you know, for some applications that's okay. I don't want to bash that too much. I mean, you know, they, for a lot of the things that they're interested in, that's okay. Um, but for the user interface type applications, the face recognition type applications, it's not acceptable. And so, that's fine. So, but, you know, and I'm going to talk about a couple of algorithms. I think those algorithms are great for real-time applications, but if I, if I had some semi-interactive application, I wouldn't necessarily use those algorithms. There are other algorithms you could use. So I'm, I'm not saying give up on other algorithms. I'm just saying there is sort of a trade-off between speed and generality and a variety of things. So to talk, to talk about this algorithm, I'm going to have to go back and tell you a little bit more details about these models than just saying it's a function. So these are 2D models at this point. We'll come to 3D models later. The model of the shape is a mesh, which is a bunch of coordinates. In this case, the 68 coordinates. So we have x1, y1, x2, y2, up to x, y, x68, y68. And that defines this mesh in the image. And then I have, in this case, there's three basis vectors. Typically, there's like 10 to 20 of these. But each of these is also a, a uh, 68 times 2 is 136 dimensional uh, vector. And I have a bunch of those for each of these. And by taking a linear combination of those and varying the parameters, I can make the face move. OK, um, okay. what about the texture part, the appearance part? Um, this is just an image. It's an image in the mean face shape. So, and then this is actually just basically eigenfaces. I have an, an average face plus a linear combination of eigenfaces. And in this case, this is actually different data. I apologize for that. But this is um, primarily modeling illumination in this case. This is a pretty small. Right. Right. So, yeah. So that's, yeah. OK. <laughs> um, so how do we build these models? So these models are built offline using some hand-constructed data. So the, you sit down with a bunch of, you take some video sequence of the people you want to model. And you hand mark those 68 points on all of those images. Very time consuming. And you have to do it pretty carefully. And, but it's offline. Once you have that, the application is ready to go. The actual process, once you have this, this training data, is, is straightforward. I will come back later, hopefully, to tell you how you can perhaps automate this process. Um, it's two steps. So there's two algorithms. Uh, an algorithm called Procrustes, um, which what this does is it removes the global uh, translation, rotation, in-plane, and scaling. And uh, so, you know, the training data, the face may be pretty small, may be big, maybe all over the image. So that just removes that. And so what's left is the shape deformation of this face, and that is computed using principal components analysis, which just finds the main linear modes. Okay, the uh, the appearance part is connect this is just eigenfaces with one caveat in that we first take the input images of the faces and we warp them into the, the mean face shape before we perform PCA. Um, okay, so I have a, a texture model, an appearance model, and a shape model. How do I generate a model instance? I just uh, you are um, image coordinates. Uh, yeah, like U and V. So the reason I don't use X and Y is I'm going to use X later to be X, Y, Z, like 3D points in the world. So yeah, it's just what, what, what right. is the independent domain? It's just fixed. So they're, they're, if you like row and column. Okay. okay. So I uh, so generating a model instance is just simply a matter of warping the mean face appearance onto the, the model. Okay, this is fine. But then this still exists in the model coordinate frame. I still need to put this back into the image. And I do that with a similarity transformation. So a 2D rotation translation and scale. And this is, in, if you like, this is sort of inverting the Procrustes analysis. And so for the, for the next few slides, I'm going to talk about the algorithm. And I, I want to sort of avoid the, talking about these details. So I'm going to just talk in terms of this shape warp W, which maps pixel coordinates in the mean face U up into the image here, where P are the shape parameters. So as I move P around, the shape will change in the image. Okay. 
Okay, uh, just one quick slide. Just to show that we can handle this similarity transformation, just so that I don't need to talk about it anymore, it's, it does, we have taken care of that. Okay, so we're going to pose this as a nonlinear optimization. So we're going to assume that we're pretty close to the right answer. In this case, it's actually really close to the right answer, but pretty close to the right answer. We're going to write down an energy function, then we're going to minimize it. Okay, so given the correct answer, I can take this, this mesh in the image and I can extract the pixels out of there and warp it back onto the mean shape. And then I can subtract that from my current estimate of what the face looks like. And I can then take a sum of square differences between those and I then want to minimize that over the appearance parameters and the shape parameters. So this is a nonlinear optimization. Typically, you may have 20 shape parameters. You may have 50 appearance parameters. It, it sort of depends on the, the exact training data and the exact scenarios. Okay. So, you know, one approach is to take the same approach as uh, plants and better and say, well, let me pull out numerical recipes in C and implement, you know, standard algorithm. And it typically ends up being pretty slow. Okay. And I say for certain applications, that's okay. Why is it slow? First, you have a lot of appearance parameters. I mean, it's three, typically three to four times as many. It would be best if we could somehow avoid those. Secondly, if I'm going to do some sort of gradient descent over these parameters here, I, I'm going to end up taking gradients of this thing and gradients of this thing. And the point at which I evaluate the, 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 the gradient of the W, the Jacobian, will actually depend on P. I need to evaluate it at P, the current estimate of the parameters. So if the face comes in and the face starts at like full profile, then I need to compute dw, dp for like a full profile face. And if it's frontal, I need to do it for a frontal face. And so this has to be re-evaluated theoretically for every iteration of the algorithm. And also, the, the algorithm, it uh, the input image comes in, I'm going to have to compute gradients of this input image, and that, you know, I only get that at the runtime, and I would, would ideally not have to like to do that. Okay, so this, I'm now going to go through, you know, basically three mathematical tricks that avoid each of these things, three things in turn. Okay, so <laughs> this is the one slide that has the most equations on it, and so after this it's hopefully all downhill. But I, and also, I should say, the following slide has uh, some sort of pictorial representation of this, so if I lose you, don't worry. But basically, the thing that I'm trying to minimize can, out, can be regarded as the, a vector. If I take all the pixels and I string them up into one vector, it's essentially the length of that vector. Okay. So how, how many parameters do you have? Uh, There's like 160 or so? Uh, say, uh, say 70, say 20 shape parameters and 50 parameters, parameters although it varies. So, so this is Pythagoras' theorem, which says the length of a vector is equal to, the length squared is equal to the length squared in this direction plus in this direction, so long as these guys are orthogonal. That's all this is. So it's going to say, in, I'm going to compute in sort of the A direction and then in the direction orthogonal to A. So if you look at this, this first term, this, um, maybe I should go back. This I'm computing in the direction orthogonal to A, so anything that has an A in it, I can just get rid of. Okay. So this is independent of lambda. All the lambdas have disappeared. The second term, okay, I'm going to compute in this direction, but this term here allows me whatever this minus this is, with this I can minimize this to be exactly zero. So whatever p is, I can always find lambdas so that this, this term is zero. Eh. Some kind of pseudo inverse or something? Uh, no, this is uh, basically this spans this space that I'm measuring the distance in. So whatever vector residual this gives you, I can generate this okay. to make it zero. Okay. That's assuming m is large enough, a little m. Uh, uh, well, OK, so the dimension of this space is the same as this. So, okay, so the minimum is always zero, so it, it doesn't depend on P. So I can break the optimization over the joint set of parameters into two steps. I can first optimize this with respect to P, and then I can optimize this with respect to lambda, but this is actually linear, so this actually has a closed form solution. And I can also do this at the end, so 
And sometimes you don't even want to do this. If I'm just tracking, I only care about the shape parameters. Um, so scheme, just a visualization of this, if I'm trying to minimize, this is uh, what I'm trying to minimize. I'm trying to get close to the origin. Then you also have this linear subspace. Then I, I want the closest point to the origin. I want this, this point. How do I find that? One way to find that is to only consider the distance in this direction, orthogonal to the linear subspace, and the closest point to the origin in this direction is here. That's what step one does. And then step two just walks along the linear subspace. Um, the, second, the second part is, so now I got rid of the appearance and I'm just looking at this. So this is, you know, most of you are vision people, maybe. So this is just Lucas Canati, essentially. This is image alignment, mosaicing, whatever you want to call it. Um, I, want, I want to take the mean face, in this case just the eye, and I want to find the location in this image that that exists, potentially allowing non-rigid deformations of it. Okay, the normal way you do this is you assume you know the current estimate of the shape parameters and you solve for an update delta p. And then you take that delta p and you add it to p and you get p plus delta p and then you iterate that process. So that is actually not the only way to do this optimization. Um, so this is a paper that Rick and, and Harry wrote. It was about mosaicing in 2000. And essentially, they described it potentially a little bit differently. But one way to look at it is, think about it this way. I, have, I know p. I have a current estimate of p. So I know this warp. So let me take this image and warp it back here. And then let me just throw this image away. OK. And then let me do image alignment here, but I'm close to the right answer, so I'm close to the identity here. And so I can actually do image alignment here, and I can start at the identity, which I'm going to assume that a p equals 0 is the identity. And so I, I then, uh, instead of using w of p plus delta p, I have w of 0 plus delta p. And so then when I take the Jacobian, this is evaluated at p equals 0, which is the same for every iteration. This can be pre-computed. OK. So there is a proof of equivalence of these in, in the paper. Um, and these are just the equations versions. But basically, the main thing is nonlinear optimization, you, you generally think of it as computing delta p and adding it to p. That's not the only way to do it. And if you reformulate it a different way, you can get additional sort of benefits. Um, the second thing is, uh, this is the same diagram. Um, if I'm close to the identity here, then aligning this to this or this to this, it's, it's the same thing. Again, there's, an, there's a mathematical proof of that that's OK, and there are some assumptions there. But intuitively, it's like if I'm close to the identity, it doesn't matter which I align to which. And so I can flip the role of those two images, and then that flips instead of computing gradients of i, gradients of a0. So the price you have to pay, though, is the update is not p goes to p plus delta p. It's actually I need to invert this warp, and then I need to compose it with this warp. So and again, just the equations. Um, so if you write all this down, this is you now still have to decide what sort of algorithm you could use. Leibniz, Marquardt, Gauss, uh, Gauss, Newton, Newton. Uh, conjugate ga gradient, whatever you want in this step. Um, the standard thing to use is Gauss-Newton in this sort of literature. Uh, don't worry too much about these equations, except this term here is completely constant. Okay, Using the gradient of the mean face, that's constant. I know that when I build the model. I'm evaluating this at, at 0. It's constant. This is actually also the mean face. And then to deal with the appearance variation, I do need to project this into this orthogonal subspace. But that's something I can take care of in the pre-computation step. So the online algorithm does four things. It takes the input image, and it backwards warps this onto here. This is a piecewise affine warp. This is very easy to implement in software, in real time. It's not hard. I subtract from the mean face. This is just subtracting two images. It's easy. I then dot product this with one constant image for each parameter. 
Again, this is easy. It's just a, a dot product between those images, it's just one scan over the image. And the main point is that these are, so long as you do the inverse compositional, these are provably constant and can be pre-computed. And then the final thing, the price you have to pay for reformulating it is you can no longer do P goes to P plus delta P, you have to invert these warps. And so, but this, it's pretty tricky, because you have to be careful how you do this, but the main thing is you can do this fast because this is operations on two meshes that I don't have to look at the whole image. So computing this is, is not a computational burden. Um, so you get results like this. So the 2D algorithm runs about 230 frames per second on just a standard PC with no, no hardware help at all. Um, yeah, we were a little bit careful with like some of the inner code, but we didn't really do too much to optimize it. I mean, we use standard libraries for matrix star products and so on, but there's no hardware that's running behind this. Um, Sorry? And you're brave enough to do the overlay. You yeah. see that it still looks okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, basically, if it, if it converges, it converges great. If the point of the real thing is how often does it just completely wander off? This is a, a very nice generalization of direct methods. Right. So, but you never use any features at all right. in here, right? right? So. Are there cases where you think features might be useful? Why are you um, sort of so pure in your direction? So that's that's a theoretical that's a you know question I would really like to answer. Is huh. you know, just have two images and you want to register these two images with respect to whatever, homography or mm -hmm. should you use features or should you use a direct method? Mm -hmm. And it, it depends on what's in the image, right? It's it's easy to come up with simple cases where the direct method would always work and the, the feature method won't ever work and vice versa. Um, but ideally, it'd be nice to sort of come up with something where you can take the input images, perform some operation, and says, "Well, you should use features for this, or you should use a direct method, or both." Yeah, or a combination. Throw things into an optimization. Right. Okay. And actually, actually that's also a good point. Is you can um, one extension of this is to you know perform the direct method with a constraint that comes from features, right? And there's no reason you, you can't do that. And we, we essentially do that in the, the 3D algorithm. So, so that's that's definitely you know we can sort of do it in this framework and it's also a question I'm interested in. Um, so there's a, a framework of these algorithms. Um, I guess the original Lucas Canade and then this R algorithm. There is w one algorithm that's a lot of people know about the Hegel Bell Humor algorithm that tries to switch the roles of the two images without using the compositional framework and it's it's mathematically really nasty and so you can actually only do this for very simple warps, basically translations and affine warps. And the main thing is this algorithm does also apply to a wide range of, uh, of uh, applications. And I'll touch more on this later. How do you evaluate an algorithm like this? Okay, I can show you nice movies. We have, you know, in all the papers there are quantitative evaluations. There's always a question, how do you get the ground truth? So the way we do this is we take a video sequence. This is just showing one person, one frame. Um, we then basically somehow get the ground truth. If that involves marking it by hand, that's fine. Okay. Typically, we just track through the sequence to generate the ground truth. And then we perform synthetic tests where we perturb away from the ground truth with a known magnitude perturbation and then see if we come back to the right answer. And so then we can determine whether it converged and how quickly it converged. And so all the quantitative evaluations look something like this. So there's, there's, you always get these two graphs on the, on the left is on the y-axis is the frequency of convergence. So of all the trials, how many, what percentage of the time did it converge? And on the x-axis is the magnitude of the perturbation. So the further I perturb it, the less likely I'm going to converge. So you're always going to get a graph that drops off, and the higher the graph, the, the better. And so in this case, the green algorithm is better. Um, on here, this is a this is how fast the algorithm converges. One thing that always people get confused by is why are there two graphs here? That's because it's just basically here we generate a bunch of perturbations that are about 10 pixels RMS error. Here we generate a different set of samples, and we're just trying to show two sets of results on one graph. The main thing here is like the green graph converges faster than the red graph. So what I'm showing here, this is uh, one of a large number of graphs, but this is just to show the importance of performing the actual inverse compositional update rather than just adding it. If you, a lot of these sort of papers just 
assume you don't have to do this and um, essentially implement this red algorithm. Um, okay. So a couple of questions earlier about how does this initialize. This is a, I apologize for the lack of anti-aliasing on this movie, but uh, basically come down, it's a face detector, um, it's running Viola Jones in the background, so the two threads running on a dual processor machine, comes, occludes his face, breaks, re moves, and it reinitializes. Okay, so in the background it's running Viola Jones and then fitting. Actually, the, the right person to ask how to put these two together is Kentaro Toyama, right? That was pretty much his PhD thesis. So maybe it's good that he's not here. But even though this looks pretty bad, it doesn't matter because it's sort of running in the background. This is the main thread, and this only relies on this when the, the tracking fails. So, um, and if, if you think the face detector doesn't work well, you can go and talk to Paul and ask, you know, maybe it's our implementation. But Okay, so it does... And we've also, you know, we have algorithms that are robust to occlusion and so on. Okay, so, but I would like to move on to 3D. Okay. Um, you don't have to rush because we have a whole hour. Okay. Okay. So maybe we should take two, two seconds, just take a breather. Yeah. So that, um, okay. <laughs> um, so, I mean, my perception of the feeling in the, the vision community in the whole, the, as a whole is 3D is hard. It's kind of spooky. You know, what's hard about 3D? Ooh, you know. Um, you know, and this is one of the things that's like, you know, results like this where I try to fit my 3D face model and it's, it's, it's really slow. And then the, the 2D, even, the, you know, the Coos and Taylor, they always got it to work pretty fast. Um, there's this question, it, why is 3D harder than 2D? So... You know, why can't you just take the algorithm I described and apply it to 3D data, right? So, um, okay, I'm going to give you an argument for why it's harder, okay? And we'll see whether, we haven't tried this out too often, so we'll see if we can convince you. I think Takeo managed to understand it, so I'm sure you'll manage, Rick. So in, in the, <laughs> in the um, inverse compositional, we, you're doing multiple things, but perhaps the main key step is I'm going to take gradients here on the input image, and I'm going to move them over to here, okay? And in, in the proof of a correctness, there's an assumption that at the correct answer, the gradients here match the gradients there, in some sense, compensating for the warp, and that's why you can trade them off. Um, so what about 3D? Well, sure, right? I mean, I just, the only change between this slide and that slide was I changed U to X from 2D to 3D, and instead of working with images, I now have volumes. I, I thought you were going to solve the 3D model fitting to the same color images video sequence. That's the next. Oh, okay. Okay. So this this generalizes no problem, but this is this is talking about basically volumetric medical data, MRI, MRI data, CT data. You can implement this with CD data. There's no you know nothing spooky about 3D in that sense. The difficulty comes when sorry about this slide, it's not so good, but where I have in this case this plane or a surface in 3D, and then I'm going to take images of it. And I, I take some camera matrix and I take some projection of this. Um, okay, so in, if I want to compute a sort of a 3D rotation translation of this object, I need, there, there are ways around this, but I really want to take these 2D gradients up here and map them up to 3D gradients here and then drive the... <laughs> you're sort of jumping ahead. Okay, you're, you're driving the, the optimization. If the warp is 3D points go to 3D points, I need 3D gradients to drive that optimization. So I essentially take 2D gradients here and kind of make up a 3D gradient here. If you write down the equations implicitly, this is what you're doing. At the right answer, the 2D gradients, so if I have this object and I rotate it in 3D, at the right answer, I see the same image. But on, on the surface of the scene, the 3D object moves to match the model, and then the gradient along the surfaces do match up, but the the orthogonal perpendicular component, orthogonal to the surface, doesn't match. And that, the way you generate that depends on the actual the position of the camera relative to the surface. Okay. <laughs> Not entirely convinced. But, so, I think what you'll want to say is, well, you know, okay, I want to compute the 3D motion of this object. Why can't I still just use the 2D gradients? 
and um, you can. So the, the algorithm, the inverse composition, as we described it, you can't. Uh, but we, we gave some from probably version of our paper to Thomas Vedder, and he had a paper in ICCV 2003 that did this. So he used 2D gradients, 2D gradients, and a, a 3D rotation of this object, 3D transformation of the object. There is one technical issue that you have to address, and they have a cute solution to this to avoid the fact, previously I assumed that you need the identity P, P to be P equal zero. You can get around that. They have a little cute, but there are some technical issues with this paper that I can, it doesn't actually work quite as well as you might think, and it's still pretty slow. Um, I can talk more in detail about this later. The second approach is, is our approach, which is, again, is, you know, not necessarily competing, but just different approaches, is to use both a 2D model and a 3D model. And so a lot of people's reaction when you say this is, okay, I'm doing this nonlinear optimization over 2D and 3D, Rather than just over 2D, I now have more unknowns. Surely it's going to be less robust. You know, it's higher dimensional. It's got to work worse. And that's not true. That's somewhat counterintuitive, but that turns out not to be the case, and I'll show you some results later. Okay, what does a 3D model look like? It's exactly the same as a 2D model, but I have a 3D mesh rather than a 2D mesh. And how do I create such a model? Well, one thing to do is, is the equivalent of the 2D, but just do it with range data. That's fine. Another approach is to use uh, 2D video sequences and use some sort of non-rigid structure from motion to create this. Um, we actually just use the second approach. Just We just prefer to work with images. Um, I think everyone here knows what structure from motion is. It's I'm going to move this camera around, I'm going to track some points, and I'm going to build a 3D model of those points in the world, and I'm going to compute the camera motion. This is a classic problem that dates back to 1979 at least. Um, there's lots of papers on this, and some people even did their PhD thesis on it, I believe. So. Uh, so non-rigid structure, rigid structure of motion, you basically you track these points in the world. In our case, these are points on the face with the face mesh, and you compute a rigid shape. Recently, basically starting with Chris Bragler, um, there's been a, a variety of extensions to structure from motion to also compute the non-rigid shape modes. Uh, we, we use this paper because it's a linear algorithm, and whatever. Anyway, factorization is sort of a CMU thing, so, so we use this. Okay, I now have a 3D model. What does the 2D, what does the texture model look like? The appearance model is the same. It's just, it's just an image. It's, this is exactly the same slide as before. How do I instantiate a model? Um, almost the same, except for here. I now have a. I'm just moving this so you can see the 3D. I just map, texture map this mesh. But now I need to put this into an image. I need to do the equivalent of the 2D similarity transformation, which is just a camera matrix. We use a weak perspective model. You could use any camera model you really want. It's, it's independent, um, so we can generate an image. OK, so when we say we have a 2D model and a 3D model, this is what we mean. We have what we had before plus this. And so I'm going to use overbar, overline as 3D parameters and 3D shape models and so on. So you don't anywhere in here have a real rigid 3D rotation? Uh, in the, uh, the camera matrix here. Okay, that's how we right. Okay, so the so if you go to the next slide then, what is your three D shape model modeling then? It's not modeling the rigid It's modeling rotation. the some people's faces are fatter than others. Ah. It's okay. modeling the, the expression is a good question. Okay. Um, right. So it, it's true that the pose variation is the major effect, but right. you know, people's faces are different shapes. So why is the three D shape model needed in addition to the three D shape model? To make the optimization fast. Um, so if you directly run it off the 3D shape model, it, you end up with the same problems that plants are better. So the way that we do the optimization is we do the 2D optimization. Exactly, this is just a subset of the previous slide. And then we also take the 3D shape and we, we project that into the image with, a, with the camera matrix. And we impose the constraint that that equals the 2D shape model. So I'm now optimizing this term 
subject essentially to this soft constraint that the 2D shape equals the projection of the 3D shape. So in this optimization, when this guy is moving around, it can no longer move arbitrarily in like the 2D shape space. It can really only move in the legitimate like nonlinear manifold that's the projection of the 3D shape space. So it actually um, constrains that optimization to only move as though it's a 3D object. And um, yeah. So the face doesn't deform it. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, sh the 3D shape is also deformable. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the main effect is the pose, but yeah, the, the sh this 3D shape is shape. I'll, I'll show you in a moment. In a second. So and, okay, so we need a large weight on this. Now we have extra unknowns in this optimization. Um, So how, how does the algorithm go? It's, it's basically the same. Um, we use the projectile to get rid of the appearance. Um, this is exactly the same, so we can pre-compute everything identically. But then I have this third term, uh, sorry, the second term that I have to worry about. But So basically we do, for this, we compute everything online. Like there's no pre-computation, there's no application of inverse compositional. But the thing is, this is just matching one mesh to another mesh, so I have 68 points, so this, this can all be done in real time, no problem. Um, and the, the speed drops, drops by, in this case, about a factor of four, mainly because of the computation of the second part. So I guess this is almost your question, Rick, the, where does the rotation come from? So the rotation is embedded in the camera matrix here. Um, we solve for the camera matrix. We don't actually use this model. This is just sort of illustrative. But this is to show the camera matrix includes a rotation of translation in 3D. And we can just extract the rotation of the face from the camera matrix. Um, you've seen this movie before, but I just want to show it to you once again. So here. <coughs> The white mesh is the 3D shape projected into the image. The blue dots are the 2D shape model. And this is the initialization. In this case, they're not initialized to be equal. We, we, know, we can initialize them to be equal. We know how to do that. But in this case, they weren't. When you run the optimization, they just immediately become identical. Oops. Um, so let me just. Some of these, they're initialized identically. I think the second one, yeah, they're pretty different. And so really, the image is driving the blue dots, and then the blue dots is being constrained by the white match. Um, again, you've seen this. This is just a duplication to show you. It runs real time, and the demo works great. Um, OK, so coming back to the question of now, 2D compared to 2D plus 3D, 2D plus 3D has more unknowns. It has the, three un the 3D shape modes. It has the, the camera matrix. But it's more robust. Why is it more robust? It's more robust because the 3D shape modes have less degrees of freedom than the 2D shape modes. And they constrain the 2D shape modes to only move as though they're 3D. So there are actually less local minima. And it converges faster, too. Which some people find counterintuitive. But she works well. OK. Uh, multiple images, it's pretty straightforward to generalize this to multiple images. Um, the, these cameras are synchronized. The images are taken exactly the same time, but they're uncalibrated. Um, generalizing the equations is just, I now have three images rather than one image. So I just essentially put in an extra summation over the extra images, and I, I just have a single 3D shape that I'm solving through. I have a separate camera matrix for each of the three cameras, but I have a single 3D shape. And just a couple of examples of this running. Um, so you, it solves the, you can think of the poses as the, the kind of the camera matrix. And it solves for a separate pose or a camera matrix for each guy in turn. It, uh, of course, you can also track. And oh, this is approximately, if you have n, n images, three images is about three times slower. Just everything. OK, so this is something that we were working on for CBPR, but we didn't make it. But basically, in 
when you do this multi-view fit, you solve for a camera matrix for each camera. So you're solving for the relative orientation, the sort of the extrinsic calibration of these cameras. And we, we actually just have this very simple intrinsic model. So you, you can also solve for focal length, too. But basically, the goal would be to initially, we don't know the camera matrices, do a multi-view fitting, extract camera matrices, and then I can go back, and now I can refit this, but I know the camera matrices. And instead, I just solve for a global rotation translation of this object, which we have some results that show that's more robust, but not good enough to submit the paper. Then uh, the question earlier about the, the cheeks. So one possible way to do cheeks is to you know, build a model for me, bring me back in the lab, create this model, and then start doing things like stereo between these three cameras to, f to flush out the cheeks. That's something we've definitely not done anything on. OK, so am I still OK time yeah, I think so. Um, so that, um, should I take questions on the fitting before I move on to construction? Sure. So, so uh, in, in your tree, um, right. you basically have the high-dimensional space. And right. So with your, with your uh, 3D constraint right. on it, you're basically slicing out a manifold. Right. And right. only, well, you're allowed to kind of drift off of it depending on what K is. Yeah. So if K is infinite, you're right. directly on it. So effectively, you have fewer degrees of freedom. Yeah, you're allowed exactly. To so that's yeah. the whole point yeah. of why it's better. Right, right. So typically, if you have K too low, then it just sort of does the same as a 2D, and then sort of kind of beyond a certain point, when it doesn't matter what K is. It so what happens if K goes in? To infinity, right? You're, you're absolutely constrained to be um, infinite. It's not allowed to drift so off. Basically, at some point, you read a, a precision issue with the, with the, um, you know, numerical precision in the the computer, and like the number of bits that I'm adding. The the three D two D constraints are all like you know ten to the power of a hundred, and then the, the image constraints are ten to the minus a hundred. Then the two D constraints just disappear when you add the two together. So if k is too large, then just numerical. Uh, precision is an issue. Right. There's precision and there's also conditioning numbers, right? When you're doing the iterative algorithm, if the condition number gets big, your convergence can slow down. Right. Um, I don't think that is a problem in this case, but I. I um, okay, so model construction. Ideally, you would like to do this. You'd like to take some random images from this as the ferret database. Okay, in this case, they're aligned based on the eyes and the nose. But uh, just random images and give them to your unsupervised learning algorithm that gives you a face model. Okay? I mean, this is, you don't want to hand mark it. You don't want to use range data. You just want to take your, your database and do this. So we have an algorithm that does this. But here's the, <laughs> Rick's like, no, nah, I don't believe you. <laughs> you're correct. You don't... Your face must be very transparent. <laughs> uh, you're correct. It, it only works when you're very close to the right answer or you have very simple data. Okay. So I'm not going to go through the details, but it does work on certain sets of simple data. We, we, there are multiple reasons for going to simple data. One is for this data here, I know the right answer. I have white squares that are rotating, translating, and scaling. It's four unknowns. So my algorithm better tell me I only need four parameters to, to code that. Um, the way we, we do the optimization, we basically formulate this as a, essentially an image coding problem that I want to find the, the AM, the shape vectors, the appearance vectors, everything. This huge is probably like hundreds of <coughs> thousands of dimensional optimization that best explains the input data. Um, here's you know, one example just to show it can converge with very simple data. In, okay, I'll let this play once and then I'll explain it. Okay, maybe I need to really reset this. So what, what I'm showing here is the input image with my current estimate of what the AM mesh should be. So initially, that's just kind of this average, this canonical shape. And then the, the white square will jump around. This is my current estimate of the AM, which is like this texture map underneath here, which is very blurred out here because the, it's basically computed as an average of the white squares. This is the, the error between these two. And I drive the optimization to minimize this error. And so I do that in two steps. I align this to this to minimize this, and then I recompute this. And you know, I, I realize that this isn't particularly impressive data, 
but I actually think it, it's somewhat interesting that this does even converge in that you're generating from this Gaussian blur something that has quite a lot of structure in here, strong edges in this. And I mean, we, we have some simple phase sequences where this does converge, but it certainly doesn't work on like arbitrary phases. One question. You started with this mesh over here, which right. kind of has a nice property of the right. squarish thing in the right. middle. So, um, if this right. had a triangle, would it have worked? Or did it so, uh, it's a very good question. Okay. There are lots of answers. One is actually, ultimately, we should be posing this as an optimization where we also try to find what the best mesh is. And that's sort of related to, you know, given a surface, what's the best triangulation of it and the generalizations of that. What the properties of this mesh really, all it needs is um, basically, um, let me, it's, it's mesh, somewhat. The parameters of, of warping that mesh have to sort of eventually match the parameters of your model. It's somewhat independent of the mesh model. I mean, it does, you know, again, this is still square, but, you know, this, this, this converges fine, too. It's sort of, this, it's a more complicated mesh, and there are, if you look on here, there are triangles that have no data on, so there's, you know, there's triangles that have uh, um, um, the, the aperture problems. And so it's, if you have too many triangles, it does still work. But it is a good question, and I don't have, you know, ideally I, I would like to see an algorithm where we, over time, sort of, we have an initial mesh, and then we, we build something, and then we refine the mesh. Sure. But that's gonna, always going to be some sort of greedy search, and I, I don't know. Um, okay, I just need to... Um, so for this simple data, it does work. You do get... Um, you know, what you expect, which is if I show just translated data, I just say two parameters of scale. I have rotations and scale, it needs four parameters. So it's what you expect. Okay, how do you use this in practice? It doesn't work on, you know, say, give me a random collection of face images, it doesn't work. However, if I hand build an AAM, hand build a model, which involves clicking all these points, it's horribly error prone, and then I use that to initialize this algorithm, it generally converges. Okay, you might say, why do you want to do that? Well, you know, hand clicking is error prone. It's not that good. It's not going to give you the best model. And I'm sorry, but the, these graphs are actually from a different paper, so they're slightly different format. But um, essentially, in the y direction is the frequency of, of how often this converges. Like, the higher up, the more robust this algorithm is. So if I take my hand constructed model, I then run my automatic construction algorithm, it refines the model and gives me a better model that it fits better. It's, it has less parameters and it, the ro fitness, robotic, uh, the robustness of fitting is, is higher. Um, okay, the model update questions. <laughs> okay, um, this was, again, I like to go back to really simple data. Okay, we want to do model update for AAM, so let's go back, what's the simplest possible case? Simplest possible case is template tracking. Okay. So in this case, I'm going to track this car by taking this template and then just doing Lucas Canade through this whole sequence. The car drives off into the distance. Okay. What does model update in this mean? It means how do I update the template to keep it up to date as the appearance changes as this goes through shadows and so on. The naive thing to do is this. So I, I take a template. And then on the first frame, I, I optimize this and, can, and track to the first frame. I then update the template. Okay, so Rick knows what's going to happen, <laughs> right? So this is not going to work, right? So I do this. I'm, I'm doing it every iteration, okay, just to stress the algorithm. And then it tracks. And if you notice, if you look at TN, it does update and it goes through shadows. It changes. And it tracks great, but it's just pretty soon it drifts off and it's not tracking the car, it's just tracking some sort of arbitrary part of the world that may or may not um, include the car. So I would argue sort of the main, well, well it's maybe main should be one technical challenge, but um, one major technical challenge, any model updating algorithm is how do you know that this thing is not going to drift off and start modeling like some random part of the background? And Okay, so we, you know, obviously have an algorithm that solves all this, right? Uh, uh, 
it, this is pretty simple, and I wouldn't say it was a total solution to this. It, so one thing this doesn't deal with is a, is a uh, visibility changes, but you can basically do the same thing. Now we, collect, we keep two templates. We keep the latest template that is extracted from the previous frame, and we also keep the first template. And the way that we do the fitting is we first, in the second frame, we first uh, fit with the template from the previous frame, and then we fit from the, with the first template. And this first fitting again with the first template is essentially performing a drift correction. So now in this sequence when it finally plays, it does update the template TN every frame, but it applies this sort of simple drift correction that um, does, uh, you know, keeps, keeps it uh, on track. This is, there are, I don't think this is obviously the final solution to this kind of problem, but there are elements of this that I think do go into the final solution, but this track's fine. Um, okay, does, does this template update help? Yeah, it does. It's actually a huge, huge benefit. So the difference between these two is this is tracking through that sequence without any update of the template, just using the first frame, and then this is with the, the updated template with the drift correction, and it's a, a lot more robust. And so essentially what this is saying is if you want to track you want to track from the previous frame in the, in the video sequence. That, that's all it's worth saying. Okay, you can apply it to, to AAMs. And this is an example where we have, it's a generic model for sort of a, about 100 people from a lip reading database, an IBM database. And then we're going to track this woman's face and it's going to update the appearance model of this person online and um, tailor this, this model to her. And so what's going to appear in the top right is a model that's going, going to converge and it's going to look like her. And so it, like, it's really quick. A couple of iterations and then she's, it's, it looks like her and it knows I'm just tracking this one person. Um, again, you can do synthetic quantitative tests that show that this does um, result in a, a big performance increase if you track with a person-specific model. Okay. So, okay. Conclusion. Um, okay, summary. You know, face modeling is a big area. You know, there are, like you can write papers on lip reading, uh, visual uh, video conferencing, just on the applications. You can also work on the fitting, work on the construction. Um, we've primarily worked on the fitting, but also on the construction. And as I say, this this is an area that lots of people are working on right now. Um, I want to give you some sort of underlying theme, which is nonlinear optimization. Um, and this is my view of vision. Okay. Computer vision is either reconstruction or recognition. Okay. Um, this is my view of graphics, even simpler. <laughs> is, uh, okay, rendering, some subset of graphics. Is take an image, I take a C model and I render and I generate it. Most of vision, most of reconstruction can be posed as minimize the image minus the, the rendered scene. And here are, here are a few applications, a um, few techniques, right? stereo, structure for motion, uh, even things like super resolution, um, re uh, even things like registration and motion you can regard as sort of reconstructing the motion rather than reconstructing the 3D shape. Um, camera calibration, sort of lots of computer vision. Nonlinear, all of these problems can be posed as nonlinear optimization. Nonlinear optimization is really important. There are essentially two energy functions you can use in vision. Right? There are combinations, but you can do what I've been talking about, which is this first one, which is image alignment, um, direct methods, uh, image to image matching, where I have a, one window and I match it to another image. And then I can have feature distance functions. This is typically structure from motion, camera, camera calibration. Okay, oops. So what, what I've presented, one aspect is this sort of framework for the first type of energy functions. And primarily with an emphasis on speed rather than robustness. And there are multiple parts to this. The first part I talked about forwards additive, uh, forwards versus compositional forwards, uh, additive versus compositional forward versus inverse. 
You can also sort of talk about you know, leibniz markad algorithms versus steepest descent algorithms. This is an orthogonal decision. I could take an inverse additive steepest descent algorithm, and I can create that. Okay, there's a second part. Okay, what about robustness, robust energy, uh, robust error functions? This is relatively straightforward to generalize these algorithms. There's the extension to appearance variation if I have appearance. This is fine um, in the L2 case. The projectile algorithm I described works fine in this case. In this case, it's not correct. And you have to find other solutions to that problem. Um, part four, this is, um, I'm going to do this direct method. And then I can also put constraints on it. In, our, in, in my talk, I used 3D constraints on the 2D parameters. You could use other constraints, like, like you suggested, of the feature matching to constrain the direct method. It's potentially interesting. Again, putting constraints on the shape parameters is easy. Straightforward, you can do it fast. Putting shape constraints on the appearance parameters is a lot slower. The algorithms are not as fast. Part five, 2D versus 3D. Uh, part six is silhouette data. This is a little bit vaguer. Um, Okay, so I mean, the sort of things that I'm interested in, on application level, I'm interested in every v vision reconstruction uh, technique. Um, but I am also interested in uh, these future directions for nonlinear optimization that drive these, these algorithms. Um, as I say, I mainly talked about speed. There are questions of robustness. Um, as, as Rico pointed out, you're always prone to local minima and the reinitialization approach is one approach. It's not necessarily the only approach. There are some hope that you can actually analyze these energy functions and come up with some sort of techniques that avoid the local minima. And at the, the least, one thing I'm pretty sure you can do is there are a lot of heuristics for these sort of techniques where you process things on a Gaussian pyramid. I don't think anybody really knows how do you choose how many levels in the pyramid, how many iterations per level in the pyramid. I think we can at least analyze the energy function and tell you how to set those parameters in the best possible way in some sense. The second, um, this you touched on, Rick, is I think combining the two energy functions is interesting. Um, I guess you've done some work on this. Uh, can you tell me which one's better? How do you combine them? Um, you can definitely combine them by doing a direct method and constraining it with the features. Um, and also, you know, what is the relationship between the two? If you, if you start blurring one, then it becomes a lot more like the other. If you take edge detection on the other, they, they start becoming pretty similar. So I'd be interested in that. Um, okay, acknowledgments. Um, I guess I, I would like to point out, you know, the, a lot of this, we have collaborated, well, not collaborated, but there's been some discussion with both Tim Kutz and Thomas Vetter, and they have provided some input. So, man, what do you think? So sh should I go through other projects, or should I? Other projects? Yeah. Um, Maybe not. It, how many slides do you have on that? Uh, ten. Yeah. No, why, yeah. Don't you, yeah. why don't you say that? You can sure. people can ask you in one-on-one. Right. Sure. So, very good. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we still have time for more questions if people want to ask. So, having also done a thesis that sort of ended with everything is nonlinear optimization, um, you know the, the robustness issues. You know every every nonlinear optimization book you open up, right. you know with this like here's the twelve algorithms, and every algorithm starts with you know find a point in the right. feasible range, and then follow my recipe. Right? Right. So that's all the feasibility. So the, the and um, one of the things that that I sort of have mentioned, you know, one is just Take a bunch of guesses and right. find, get yourself in a feasible range. You're never even quite sure if you ever right. are. Um, the other one, which you sort of hint in there, is change the function. Start with a smoother function. Okay. Well, that, that one sends you to an unfeasible range, and then go, you know, refine right. the, the actual optimization right. surface. And so, are there directions in there? And is the 2D, 3 plus 3D sort of doing that in a way? Right. Where you said, all right, I'm, I'm not. Okay. Actually, going to do the real function. I'm going to do this other one. Right. That happens that I think is probably smoother in some sense. Right. Um, so I guess there are two questions that right. The, the first, um, like this, this. So the, there are these like let's smooth things out with pyramids or you know looking at subsets of the parameters. I mean those are heuristics. Um, I think I'm going to sort of 
Let me repeat. I think you can. So in a lot of these cases, the thing that a lot of people forget about is we do know what the energy function looks like up to noise. We do have the model, and we can assume that the input image is sort of the model plus some noise. And so we can compute sort of regions of convergence. So we do know roughly what the shape, are, shape is, what the parameters are that are, uh, are going to cause problems, and which, which subsets of the parameters are not. Now that becomes, you know, it becomes high dimensional and becomes, you know, issues with that. But I think, so one concrete case is if you do this, you do face tracking, you go like away from the face and then you come back. It's very, very prone to sort of just getting stuck at a profile view. And essentially, I, I, I can't show you results to prove this, but I think essentially the, when you go out here, the local minima end up, it's sort of asymmetric. This sort of um, region in which you're going to converge is sort of not symmetric about where you are. And so one simple thing would be just to at least perturb towards the middle of that. That would, I mean, it doesn't solve the problem, but that's one suggestion. The, the random sampling, again, random sampling is good, but you can also probably do better. If you know how, how prone the various d directions are, you can sort of do that sampling potentially in a smarter way. Um, you know, generally, you wouldn't search the whole space, but you might be able to do a little bit of local searching. I mean, that's actually, I mean, you know, so one question that might come up is, why do you want a three, 230 frames per second algorithm? Well, one answer is because I want to sample, right? A few or something else. Right. Well, there's that answer, but there's also... Um, I want to run this algorithm multiple times. Sure. The second half of the question. Well, I was wondering whether the, 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 oh, the brain is really in effect. Kind of um, sort of taking a priori model and saying, I'm, I'm gonna, I've got this optimization source like this, but I'm actually going to pretend like it looks like this again. So I think the way I look at that is I don't think this is going to quite answer your question, but the way I look at that is. People, you know, I have a model, which is a better model of the world, a 2D model or a 3D model, right? And intuitively, you say 3D. And I think on some level, this backs that up. It's like the parameterization using 3D parameters is, is more constraining and contains less sort of irrelevant local minima that you might fall into. So it may be almost more touches on to how do I parameterize the problem. So if I want another example, maybe if I want to align two images with the homography, how do I... Uh, parameterize that homography. What's the best way to do it? I mean, I guess you've done some work on this. Uh, you know, do you use the normal sort of nine, uh, three by three matrix, or do you use four points in the image? Is that a better way? And, um, you know, that's, I don't know the answer to that question, but I think, you know, we have some experiments where, you know, the parameterization does affect the, the, how the algorithms work. <laughs> so. Yeah. So mentioned the the, the cross argument the other half, the original one. Yeah. Can you elaborate a bit? Uh, so they assume that there is a constant linear update between the error image and the um, update to the parameters. Okay, sorry. Um, do I have a slide that um, Um, so, so I mean, you, under, you understand you're going to compute an error image. Right? You're going to backwards warp, and then you can compute a, a difference from your current estimate, right? So you have this image that is an error image between the warped image, and um, they basically say, okay, well, look, there must be a linear relationship between that and the best update to the parameters that I can add to that. They assume that that's a constant, and you can prove that there is no constant that would give that perfect mapping. Maybe, I mean, we're going to meet, so I, I can uh, show you the, in the paper. The, I mean, I mean, I'm not sure if that's the case, but in, in one case you're doing an optimization and you, and you show pretty well how you can do the trick well I can do in these subspaces, right. the orthogonal subspaces. Right. That is somewhat equivalent to saying I have some vector and I'm breaking into two subspaces, right. in two sets sure. of coordinates, optimizing you and right. one optimizing one. That's a trick that's used by a lot of people. Sure. And a lot of people make the common mistake of assuming that if you converge in one and if you converge in the other, 
you coerced both. Right. When the, if you call that a coordinate descent, there's one trick to the theorem that says that you need global ops right. on each such yep. space for right. the whole thing to convert. It's a, it's a very, very good point. Do you, do you run into so, that or so the, yeah. your yeah. things are actually global optimal in the uh, spaces? <laughs> so that, it's a very good point. Um, the you know the argument that that's okay does rely on the assumption that each of those finds the local global minimum right and in practice if you remember right at the beginning I, of the talk I said well if I had more computation time if I didn't want this to run real time I wouldn't use this exactly the same algorithm that trick doesn't actually work too well in practice um, it's it does work okay so long as the your current estimate of the, the, the person's the appearance of the person's face is pretty close to the right answer. A lot, so essentially, it's sort of the global. You know, your point is exactly correct. The global optimum is required for the proof, but that doesn't mean that the gradient descent algorithm is going to necessarily do the right thing. Right. It could actually work well. And so empirically, um, let's see. Yeah, I, I would have to show you the paper, but I mean, we have run experiments where you vary. So there's there's the sort of mean face plus the appearance variation, right? If you're a long way away in the appearance variation space, the algorithm doesn't work so well. But by long way, do you mean many deltas outside of the standard deviation? Because you um, know, then those are unlikely faces. Right. Um, I. Th it's not so much the deltas on the standard deviation, it's sort of more like the, you know, the distance of the vector. I mean, so, I mean, you know, the, you know, the standard deviation sort of depends how much variation you have in the training data. Um, so, one way to, okay, the simplest case is to actually think about it in terms of, I'm modeling gain and bias using just offsets. And actually, if you're off by a factor of two in the gain, if, if you think, I'm looking at a face and it's actually twice as bright, then the algorithm takes steps that are half as big, twice as big as what it should. So you don't actually have to be too far off. So the solution I would, you know, as a practical system solution, and come back to the model updating, in that, you know, I, I, maybe there is a slower version of the algorithm that it runs about one second per frame in MATLAB that doesn't have this problem. Um, I would run that in the background and continuously update the, my estimate of the mean face, and I would then use that. So I'm, I'm sure that working point is, is pretty close to, to where I'm at in the sequence. So, so your, your assumption actually is that the projection space yeah. should be constant uh, between iterations. This is not necessarily true, right? Uh, constant between iterations? Should be, otherwise you should... Uh, optimized probably rather than the optimized um, um, let me see. Uh, I, I don't think it requires that. I think it's you really can just solve for the projection into the space afterwards. Um, it's sort of you really just working in this orthogonal subspace that avoids that. If you change the projection. Right. And the, the second term may not be zero. Uh, so or the, it's not not the optimal end for that use. Um, so the, okay, so this maybe comes on to are you going to allow a face that has any appearance, right? So currently you have a mean face plus you know this the PCA. Are you going to allow a face that's five standard deviations away from the mean face? The, currently the algorithm does allow that. And so whatever the projection is, I can explain it. If you want to put in constraints that, hey, you know, stay within three standard deviations or, you know, with some, some constraints, then you, need to then you need to compute the appearance each uh, iteration to, to impose those constraints. That is why if you want to, if you want to put any priors on the, the appearance parameters, it, it's slower. Is that... Ross, sorry. What's the functionality of your face? Um, okay, so I mean, it varies from data to data. Um, but how does it vary across you know, all people? 
So uh, right. you see analysis and figure out, I think you said you had 70 parameters. Right. But how many parameters do you really have? Right. And how many do you really need to write? So you should read out BMC paper this year. So uh, it's a really good question. I mean, uh, so what, what we did was we took a ferret, uh, so their frontal faces, okay, and we did, um, we sort of took 100 images and we sort of said, okay, let's build a model on the first 100 and then sort of leave one out and how well can it reconstruct the, the final person? So how many modes do I really need to explain an unseen person? For, f for frontal faces, and not including the pose variation, just the shape variation and, um, right. It's uh, that it's like you know 10, 15 kind of range. I would have to look. It depends. You know, it's obviously where you want to draw the threshold anyway. For the appearance, it's a lot higher. Basically, we found with 100 faces, and you want to do even with shape normalized. If you want to explain the the 101st person, it doesn't work very well. It's it's still not enough. And you've got things like lasses in the database, beards. So between the two, I mean, that, this paper was to try to sort of uh, you know, which is harder, the shape part or the appearance part, and Building a generic sh appearance model is harder than building a generic shape model. I think we can do that. The fitting is kind of the other way around. It's, it's the dimensionality of the shape part that makes it harder as you go. There's no application of that. If you're trying to attract one person, you don't really care about people who look very different. From, whereas if you're trying to use this as a recognition substrate, you have to capture the appearance variation. But, I mean, I think. You know, the appearance, it's like you really need a lot of parameters to model arbitrary people. And, uh, you know, so I mean, going towards a practical system like that, I mean, we're thinking of, you know, ways of model updating, you know, like this whole system that's modeling updates. We also have, like, clusters of models of, you know, they wouldn't, you know, you can think of different races, I guess. But um, essentially the model building would, would cluster the images before you build the models and then we have Some people also break the face up into sub-pieces, right? So you can sort of model independent pieces and then right. this is a compositional thing. Yeah. Right. Um, so, I mean, I think, so there's a lot of work with sort of shape, active shape models, right? Where it's just a, essentially a, a line drawing from active contours and so on. Those generalize a lot better. And, um, the appearance is harder. Um, Thanks, we should let you get some lunch. Okay, thanks.